e parokos kebe telebes kabran talame kefer besandoro bosharada. Father, we give you glory. We give you praise for such an opportunity. Thank you for all your children. Thank you for this wonderful conference. We thank you, the Lord. Once again, you brought us here this year to celebrate your worth, to celebrate your power, to celebrate your glory. Thank you for giving us this opportunity, even now and forevermore. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. We give God praise for such a wonderful time and another year of broken. Um, it's rather unfortunate we have to be elsewhere for another meeting so we're unable to be there physically but our spirits indeed is with you and i'm so excited about the theme of this year's conference beautiful jesus now the beauty of jesus is such an undiscussed subject and sometimes it's a little disturbing in the body of christ we don't discuss enough the beauty of the lord jesus christ one of the things i will say is when you find the lord beautiful enough nothing will be attractive to take you away and steal you and your attention from the lord once you find the lord the most beautiful no woman no man no item no worldliness nothing in this world will suffice because he is the most excellent he is the most beautiful and today i pray that in just few minutes before we continue with our worship and celebration of our Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to share a couple of things with you. So powerful. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the verse number 13, you know, Peter was writing and said, Wherefore, get up the loins of your minds and be sober and hope to the end of the grace which is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there is a grace that comes at the revealing of Jesus Christ. And it says that hope to the end of that grace. And he was not talking of the rapture. He's not talking of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, literally. But he was communicating something powerful. Because in verse 12, he says, which things the angels desire to look into. That means that he was talking about the covenant blessing of the New Testament. That he says the angels have desired to look into the terms and conditions conditions of the new covenant and he says in that looking they can't find anything but we who are born again we should get up the loins of our minds and interestingly enough the greek word for mind usually are two words dia logizomai and dianoia Dialogizoma is the analytical part of your brain. That is for calculating, that is for remembering numbers, that is for, you know, doing math in your head. Then there's also the other part called the dianoia. And dianoia is the, the, the descriptive uh, what you call it, word for the part of your mind that is for imagination. So, for instance, when Paul said in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, the verse number um, 18, that the eyes of your understanding will be flooded with light. The word understanding there is the word dianoia or imagination. That your imagination will receive illumination. Now, why God did that was this. In the new covenant, everything we are believing God for has already been done. Jesus took away our pain. Jesus took away our suffering. He was found alone on the cross so that Psalm 68 verse 11 will be fulfilled that he set the solitary in families. So God took a lot of things on himself. He had no description of his descendants, neither of his generations, because he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief so that we will be men of joy acquainted with celebration. So he became everything we should have been by judgment so that we can become everything he should have been by the legal transaction that Jesus himself did and brought us. So today, when Paul Peter sorry says that we should get up the loins of our minds, you know, he it was the word gird was a kind of picture where in those days they had this long garb of a dress and it looks like a morning coat, very long, and they use a sash in the middle of the, the waist like a belt. That belt was a girdle. Now that girdle was um, for them to run or to walk across waters, walk across muddy regions, they had to lift up the girdle. You see it a lot in some of the Indian apparel. They have to lift it up so it looks like a big, a big, you know, a bulky um, um, shorts. So you get up and put it in 
the girdle so that the tips of your garment does not touch the earth. So what Peter was saying was that our minds by television, by social media, by the situations of life, every morning you wake up, your mind gathers dirt, it gathers filth, it gathers information that is not consistent with the, the magnification of the glory of God. So by so doing, he says, get up the girdles of the loins of your mind. And the word loins there is also the word that's used for reproduction. So he's saying that literally your imagination is your reproductive organ in the spirit. So how you reproduce things is consistent with what you imagine. So remember in Ephesians 3.20, he says, God is able to do exceedingly above all that we can ask or think. So our thinking is also a product by which we come to the place of receiving answers. So Peter says, for you to be able to admire the beauty of the Lord, your loins must be girded up. Your imaginations must be held away from this worldly system so that you can find the Lord beautiful enough. You know, we find people go like, church is boring, we are praying praying and fasting is because the loins of their minds are not girded up and he says when you do this you will become sober you will become vigilant you become aware you become present in the moment and by that you'll be able to receive the grace that comes from the revelation of our lord jesus christ so every day you open the bible look for the law Every day you open the scriptures, look for the Lord. Because he said in Luke 24, the verse 27, beginning from Moses and all the prophets, he began to expound unto them all that was written concerning himself. Isn't it amazing? Jesus was teaching Jesus. And the Bible says in the book of Luke also, when at the transfiguration, chapter 22, the whole place had turned around. And in chapter 9, also a similar story was there. The whole place had turned around. And the Bible says, all of a sudden, the Lord spoke from heaven. In Moses and Elijah had appeared by the side of Jesus. Then he says that, um, 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 here, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. Even God didn't tell the disciples to hear he God. He said, hear ye him, hear ye Jesus. So God preaches Jesus. Jesus preaches Jesus. Then the last part that's very interesting is the Holy Spirit. He said, I'll send you the Spirit, which is a comforter in John 16. He will come and testify of the things I have said, and he will bear record of all that I've, I've said to you. So even the Holy Ghost, the Bible says, will not bring attention to himself, but he will speak concerning the Lord. So the Holy Spirit preaches Jesus, the Father preaches Jesus, and the Son also preaches Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is everything. In Hebrews chapter 1, the verse number 1, the Bible says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke to us by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Now, in the literal, if you check the ASV translation, American Standard Version, he says that he in sundry times and in diverse manners spoke to us in the prophets. The prophets were the message of God. When God had anything to say, he sent prophets. But he said in these last days, Jesus is the language and communication of the Father. So Jesus is the language and communication of the Father to his creation. And he has sent his son in this last day. And the Bible says something so powerful in verse 3. He says, who being the brightness of his glory. The word is effusions. What is that effusions? When you look at the sun, you cannot see the sun. We do not see the sun on earth. That's why when you look at the sun, you can see this orange, yellowish, whitish thing. But the sun is not um, orange or yellow or white. In fact, it's a red big mass ball like molten lava. If you go to space, you see it. So what we see is not the sun. We see the brightness of the sun. We see the hues of the sun. We see the rays of the sun. As Malachi said, the sun sends us rays to the earth. So what we are seeing is what scripture calls the effusions of glory. So Jesus, we cannot see God. No one has seen God at any time, according to John 1, 18, except the one and only who is from the bosom of the Father has declared him. So Jesus is actually the expression of the Father. So that Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it suffices that. He said, Philip, how long shall I be with you? If you have seen me, then you have seen the Father. So Jesus is the effulgence. He's the full package of the glory of God. He is the entire definition of who God is. And so when we talk about Jesus, so powerful. You know, many people follow um, um, 
Superman, Batman, Aquaman, they're excited by these Marvel, you know, characters. But the interesting thing is in Isaiah chapter 9, the verse number 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He says, the government shall be upon his shoulder, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The word Mighty God is the word El Gibor. It's from the word El Gibar. Gibar is where you get the word champion, a champion of a battle. In fact, in Job chapter 38, when God came to Job and said, answer me like a man, the word man is the word Gibar, the champion. Answer me like a champion. That means Adam in the garden was a champion. And the Bible says Jesus Christ is the mighty champion. Jesus is the mighty champion. That terminology also speaks of people of renowned stature. It also speaks of folk story heroes. So Jesus is the hero of God. Jesus is the hero of heroes. So if you're looking for any hero, Superman, Batman, whatever it is, Jesus is your hero. Jesus is the one you go to. Why am I saying all I'm saying? If you look at Jesus, Jesus is like a perfect diamond. Every angle of the Lord is beauty personified. Every angle of the Lord is beauty personified. Jesus is gentle, yet not soft. Jesus is hard, is he is strict, yet not hard. So in other words, when you take Jesus from every angle, I like what C.U. Spurgeon said, and, and, and he said, if you take Jesus as a man, you will find out that he is God. If you take Jesus as God, you will find out that he is man. So every angle you apply, you will find that Jesus is the most excellent one. Jesus is the excellency of all excellencies. The thing about Jesus is also this. People think that Jesus is just a person. But Jesus, who is the Christ, is not a person. He is a realm. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, you know, the verse 15, that in him should all the fullness of God dwell. But then verse 16 now says that for in him were all things created, whether they be thrones, dominions, powers, principalities. He says all things were created by him and for him. This is the American Standard Version. King James says, for by him were all things created. But in the American Standard Version, which brings the real word, it's not dire, it's en, E-N, in, for in him. So the place God created is Christ. The, the location of creation was Christ. That is why Christ became the environment for which creation finds its existence. Remember, he says, he says, for through him, all things consist. So gravity is gravity because of Jesus. The centripetal forces are centripetal forces because of Jesus. So he holds everything by the word of his power. He upholded all things by the word of his power. So you have to understand this Jesus we're talking about. He is beautiful. He is amazing. He is ah, beyond what you can ever think or imagine. The Lord, the Lord, glorious in majesty. The Lord, the Lord, glorious in beauty. Remember when God wanted to show Moses his glory. I would say he put him in the cleft of the rock and then he said, I will pass before thee and I will declare my name, the Lord, the Lord. Can you imagine? Because we don't understand. We thought it was God mentioning his name. But actually, the Hebrew word for name means character, person, ability, destiny, power. So the personality of God, the character of God, the ability of God, the, pers the person of God was what actually he says, I will declare my name. That is why he says in Songs chapter 1, the verse 2, that your name is like ointment, perfume. He was not just talking of the name Jesus. His name is also his person. And he was saying that. When his person, his name is mentioned, his person appears. And when his person appears, the smell of his person, the Bible says, is attractive to the virgins. He has a perfume, he has a smell. So you study the book of Songs of Solomon, the Bible says, my beloved touched the door knob. I could smell his aloes, I could smell his mare, I could smell the frankincense of his, his body. So the Lord has an order, and that order, Bible calls it a sweet smelling incense that the virgins do love. But quickly, um, in a short moment, so that you can have a picture of how... So, so re remember, you can have a picture of how to encounter the Lord. I like what David said in Psalm 16 verse 8. He says, I have set the Lord before me. Now notice, he didn't say the Lord has come before me. He said, I have set the Lord. That means that David had activated his imagination. Just like 1 Peter 1.13, to have the Lord before him. 
he had a picture of the Lord before him and that's how he prayed. He was able to pray with the Lord in his face, the Lord in his mind. He said, so because of that, he's on my right hand and I shall never be moved. Psalm 16, 3. So very important in critically, let's just get to um, um, some descriptions of the Lord. It's, 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 it's too, too, too short a time, of course, because of um, how the programs are for us to actually get into the realities and the full extent. These are summaries of summaries that we always say that we are all unable to fully exhaust. But in a short time, I just want to just explain a couple of things about the appearance of the Lord. Because the beauty of the Lord is in his appearance. When you see the Lord, you must have a, a picture of his appearance. And that appearance, the Bible says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God showed unto John. That is Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God showed unto John. You know, he said he showed God, he showed unto John his servant concerning the things which were shortly to come to pass. So John was come to see the revelation of Jesus Christ. Very powerful statement. And the Bible said, blessed is he that readeth the prophecies in this book. So the book of Revelation is a book that brings you blessing by just reading it. <laughs> you don't have to pray. It's said when you read Revelation, blessed are you. You receive a blessing. But let me get further into some of the descriptions of our Lord. And, and it's such an amazing experience of who the Lord is and how he's led and dealt with us as humanity. Now, in Revelation chapter 1, the verse 8, the first description of the Lord comes into play. And that first description says, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega and the beginning and the end. Then the Bible says in the verse number 11, he said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Now, these three descriptions of the Lord are not the same. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and the first and last. It has to be the alphabet. That's A to Z. He's the Aleph and the Tau. So he's the A and the Z. Number two, the word beginning and ending has to do with the action, initiation and completion. Initiation is beginning, completion is ending. Then the first and last has to do with the first man to appear and the last man standing. That's what it means. So clearly from this description, it tells you that the Alpha and Omega description of the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of the action of him that speaketh. So as the Alpha and Omega, he is the language. He is the speech. So the Alpha and Omega has to do with what God says. Then number two, the Bible also says he's the beginning and the ending. And just like I said, he is the initiator and the completer. That means that he is or has to do with what God does. Alpha and Omega has to do with what God says. Beginning and ending has to do with God, what, what has to do with what God does. And the last part, which is actually the first and last, has to do with, like I said, the first man to appear, the last man standing. This has to do with who he is. So as the Alpha and Omega, he is the entire letters of your destiny. He is the one who draws and writes your life story. Psalm 139, the verse number 16. If you read it in other translations, especially God's words translation, he said, you were, all your days were written and recorded before, when you were even before a fetus. And he said, L before you ever lived your first day. You were a fetus in, 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 before you became a fetus. The Bible said the Lord has written all your days, recorded it. And even before you lived out your first day, the first breath you took and the first cry that came out of your mouth in the hospital, before all of that, God had already written your entire life from the day you were born to the day you died. God had the record of it. He was not, he's not surprised about anything at all. And when I say all these things, I say, I want you to understand that Jesus is a realm. You see, in Acts 17, 26, he says, God has made of all men under the heavens one blood and has determined our kairos, our times appointed, and our places of habitation. Where we'll stay and the times of our manifestation. God already wrote it. But the Bible says in verse 28, Therefore, in him we live, in him we move, and have our being. So Christ is not just a person. Understand this. Christ is a realm you stay in. As a child of God, there is a realm you stay in. And that realm must be beautiful enough for you 
to enjoy the blessings. He said in John, I think chapter 16, he says, in this world you have many tribulations, but in me you have peace. So in the world there is trouble, but in him there is peace. And in him is a realm that is in another realm. So we can be in him in this world. Yet people wonder why we are all working the same walk. We are all going to town. We are all talking to same people, but we are having different experiences because some of us are in him <laughs> and some of us have recognized that we are in him. So because of that, experiences are different. But let's go further to John, when John saw the Lord. Now, this John is a very interesting person that the Lord decided to reveal himself to. Because on earth, John was the one who had appreciated God the most, the Lord the most, because he was the closest to the Lord. He constantly had his head on the bosom of Christ. So at this time, the Lord wanted to reveal to him in his glory what he looked like. And the first thing the Lord revealed to him was concerning his appearance. The Bible said when the Lord appeared to him in the verse, in the verse number 12 and verse 13, the Bible said he was in the midst of the seven golden cups. Candlestick. Now that means that that seven golden candlestick, the Lord was the middle shaft. He was the middle shaft of the seven golden candlestick. That means that just as the candlestick was, God Christ Jesus, the Lord Jesus, was actually the middle shaft of the candlestick. And that candlestick, Bible speaks of it as the seven spirits of the Lord, which goes all through the earth to perform the bidding of the Lord. And John saw him, and it's not only so, verse 13 says, his girdle was tied around his path. Pap here speaks of his heart, his chest. So Jesus is in heaven, yet he's wearing a girdle. Remember what I said? Girdle had to do with something they used to tie their garments. But they tied it when they were coming to either cross waters. And another thing I didn't add was when they're about to serve. If you read John chapter 13, you remember in the scriptures, when Jesus Christ had entered the room in John 13 verse 1, he knowing that God had put all things under his power and the time was near, the Bible says Judas went out to betray him. Then the Bible says he took and rose from supper and took a basin and took a girdle and tied it around about his and a towel and began to wash the disciples' feet. That posture of the ghetto is the posture of a servant. What that meant was that even in eternity, Jesus has the posture of an everlasting servant. Not only so, his service is not from headship. His service is connected to his heart. That's why the, the, gam, the girdle was tied to his pap. It means Jesus is lovingly serving us. Jesus is excited serving us. Jesus wants to be in our lives. Jesus is happy to be of use, use to us. So you have to understand that's the posture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's one beauty when you look at it, you go like, look, the Lord is ever ready. The Lord is ever available to hear you, to talk to you, to even join you in anything you are doing because he has a girdle about his pap and he's ready to serve you. Not only so, but the Bible also says further in verse 14 that number, number, number two, his hair was white as wool and white as snow. Now this description is very interesting. Jesus Christ has no gray hair. Now for him to have gray hair means he has aged. So the color of snow is white. So these are speaking of intrinsic colors that has nothing to do with the change of it. So what he's saying now is this, that in Daniel chapter 7, the verse 9 says, And I saw, and I saw upon all thrones were cast down. But I saw the ancient of days seated, who was seated with a garment white as snow, and his hair white as wool. That means that this description is speaking of his ancientness. Yet, in Songs chapter 5, verse 11, the Bible says the Lord has bushy locks, and his hair is black as a raven. Why is, he, why is he having a hair black as raven? That speaks of the I amness of God. When God met Moses, he said before, he spoke to uh, Moses and said to Moses that my name, that is actually what I am, is I am that I am. And he said, how can I say your name is I am that I am? He was trying to communicate to um, um, a, 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 sorry, Moses about the reality of his ancientness. So the I amness of God was revealed to Moses. And Moses even went and said, they might not understand who I'm come to tell them has sent me. And he said, when he went in Exodus chapter 6, that your fathers knew this I am I'm come to tell you as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and as the Almighty, the El Shaddai. But he is not uh, the El Shaddai. He said his name is the I am that I am. 
Nobody can be I am that I am. Why can anyone not be the I am that I am? As soon as I mention my name, Adam, you can trace my lineage. You can even track who named me. But God came and said, my name is I am that I am. Trying to tell us that nobody named him, nobody birthed him. And that name implied that he is anything he has to be. He has been anything he should have been. And he is whatever he has to be. So in that regard, he's trying to communicate to us that the I am that I am. Oh, is his ancientness. And Jesus is that ancientness. Isaiah 9 verse 6 said, Jesus is the everlasting father. Do you know what that word means? He is the father in eternities. Jesus is the father in eternities. Ladies and gentlemen, this our father and our Lord Jesus Christ is such a beautiful Messiah. And if you look at him well enough, you'll be surprised at the beauty and at the, the resplendent glory that emanates from the Lord. He is full of glory and you have to see him as such. He is the ancient one. He is, and, and, and when he saw him, he saw the ancient one. Why? He had black hair when he met his lover, but at the same time, too, when he met John, he had white hair. Because he is the everlasting contemporary. He is the eternal now, and he is the modern future. Do you understand what that means? That means that before future becomes future, he has already been there. And before everlastingness loses its um, 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 modernness, he said he is the everlasting now, eternal contemporary. There is no generation that will make God obsolete. There is no generation that will make God a cake. God is an eternal now. He is an everlasting contemporary. He is above all times. He is beyond all times. He has seen the scope of time from the beginning to the end. So that when God even talks, he doesn't talk from a start. Neither does he talk from the middle. He declares the end from the beginning because he has already seen time elapse. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the beauty of our Messiah. He has white hair, but the whiteness of his hair does not fade. It's not gray hair. It's white hair because it's the original color. So when you get to heaven right now, you will see a 33-year-old man with white hair. You will see a 33-year-old man with white hair. If there's any picture I can give you in this mundane earth, I can talk of the Lord of the Rings and the definition of the elves, how they look like. That's a similar, most mundane representation of what I'm talking about. Young face, white hair, because that's the color of his hair, even from glory. Hallelujah. And I want you to understand that this I amness was confusing for Israel. They didn't know. But when Jesus came, he said them to them in John chapter 8, that when you lift me and you crucify me, then you will know that I am. So when they nailed him, they put his name there, YHVH, Yeshua, Bamalek, Hayudin, you know, Hanitze, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And they were angry. He said, change it. Then and Pilate says, that grapher, that grapher. What is written, is written. What he was trying to say was that he told them, when you lift me, you will know who I am. And he says, my name is I am. Because before Abraham was, I am. And who was that I am when he came? I am is absolute. I, I am is, you know, obsolete. I am is distant. I am is abstract. We don't know who I am is. But when he came, in John chapter 6, when he fed them bread, he said, I'm the bread of life. When they were looking for light, he said in John chapter 8 and John chapter 9, I'm the light of this world. When they were confused about their access into glory and their access from Judaism into the new life of the new covenant, he says, I am the door. Then after a while, he said, I'm the good shepherd in the same John chapter 10. Then when they were confused, even at the tomb of Lazarus crying, he told Martha in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Then the disciples came to him asking, show us the way. And he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except by me. But you see, Israel had been a very stubborn vine. What Jeremiah said, what Hosea said, he said, Israel has been a, a vine that has not produced fruit. But Jesus appeared in John 15 and said, I am the true vine. And my father is the husband man. What he was trying to tell us this, everything God needs to be done, Jesus is. So Jesus is the consuming fire. Jesus was the fourth man in the fire. Jesus was the lion of the tribe of Judah that silenced all the lions when Daniel entered the lion's den. Listen, the Lord, our God, is beautiful. I pray that even through this session and through this service, you will come to the place of seeing his beauty. But last, last but not the least, the Bible says in Psalms 5, verse number 12, there was a description that John saw in verse 15 and verse 16. He said the eyes of Jesus was burning with fire. Now, the eyes of Jesus burning with fire was the description John saw. Many times it's described as judgment. And the Bible says also that his feet was clothed with brass, with resplendent glory. Now, these two things don't mean what you are thinking. Number one, the eyes which were burning with fire. According to Psalms 5, verse 12, the Bible spoke about, oh, the Lord having dove's eyes. Dove's eyes is focus. A dove has unifocus, unifocus. So the Lord saying he has dove's eyes, or the description of the Lord as dove's eyes means that the Lord is so focused on you. But the Bible also said, which is teary as the waters. 
that means he's looking at you and his eyes have glistened with passion like he's so in love with you his eyes have just glistened with passion and just watching him that's the beauty of our lord and the bible says which is washed with milk and the bible says in first peter chapter 2 verse 2 that you see as newborn babes we should desire the sincere milk so milk speaks of sincerity it speaks of innocence so the lord is watching with univision at the same time he's tearing with passion that would they love me you know revelations 3 20 says he stands at the door and knock if anyone shall knock he was not talking to unbelievers he was talking to the church the church of laodicea it is the lord's desire to have fellowship with his sons and daughters it's the lord's desire to have time with his people and so he's looking at you with univision that is why every time god talks to you you many of you testify every time you get a prophetic word it's as if you are the only one who will make it in life i will make you great the whole world will never know a prophet like you god will make you powerful the world will hear of you and it's as if you are the only one hearing it and you know the shocking thing you're not the only one hearing it yet when god talks to you you are the only one he's focused on child of god we are talking about the beauty of the lord the last part that even blows my mind is about the care of the lord his vision his vision is about love all he's looking at is love do you know once upon a time peter had denied Jesus Christ three times. Jesus was in Caiaphas' house. Remember the story. And, he, you know, just not too far from the Garden of Gethsemane. In that house, Peter had denied Jesus Christ in the portico, in the porch. And as he was denying Jesus, Jesus just turned and looked at him at the corner of his eye. And when you look at him at the corner of his eye, imagine you are standing in front of Potiphar, uh, sorry, uh, uh, um, Caiaphas and uh, uh, Annas. All the priests were standing in front of you. And as he was standing in front of them, they were judging him. Bible said they are smiting him, spat on his face, slapped him. All that was going on. And when he heard the cock crow three times, Jesus lost focus of his judgment and turned his back to rather look at Peter. He loves Peter so much. And he was caring for Peter in the time of his denial. Sad that Jesus was not focused on the people slapping him here. He was rather focused on Peter, who was distant about to deny him. He was just looking at Peter and says, don't, don't lose faith. Because I told you in Luke 22, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. You see how powerful the gaze of the Lord is? In John, when he was on the cross, the Bible says, look at John the beloved, son, behold thy mother. And he looked at Mary, he said, mother, behold thy son. Even on the cross in pain, all of us here always want the world to stop when we are in pain. When we lose a loved one, everybody should have pity for us. When something bad happens to us, you expect everybody to come and say sorry. But Jesus in pain, no one was around. He was rejected. Everyone fled, still was not shaking off his responsibility. He said to Mary, I know you don't have sons now, so take him as a son. And he said to John, I know you don't have a mother, and I'm leaving. She's a widow. She has no person to take care of her. Please take care of my mother. Even in pain, Jesus remembered his responsibility. That's how focused the Lord is. His eyes are eyes of doubt. But the last part is, the Bible says his feet it's like fine brass that is polished. The Greek word is chalka libanon. And that word chalka libanon is a very interesting word. Brass actually is an alloy of copper and zinc. Now, bronze on the other hand is copper and tin, but brass is alloy, it's, it's an alloy of copper and zinc. Now, this brass is actually the same thing in Exodus chapter 27, verse 2. You see, in 25, chapter 25 of Exodus, we they overlaid the Ark of the Covenant with gold, but in the brazen altar, they overlaid it with brass because brass stands for judgment. Brass is the metal that represents judgment. Silver is redemption, gold is divinity, but brass is judgment. And the Lord has brass on his feet, yet it is Chauka Libano and is a boot. The weight of that brass, copper and zinc, is very heavy. What that means is that God is slow to anger. When he's walking towards judgment, he is very slow. There is weight. He takes his time to judge. Go check it in the days of Ezekiel. Bible says when the spirit was departing from the temple, he lingered. He lingered at the east gate. Yet when he was coming on the day of Pentecost, Bible says he came with a rushing wind. So his coming is rushing, but his leaving is very slow. That's how God is. He is slow to anger. He said the Lord is merciful. The Lord is gracious, slow to anger, rich and plenteous in mercy. What am I saying? Habakkuk says, O Lord, revive thy works, chapter 3. In the midst of the years, make known, in thy wrath, remember mercy. That is the product of his feet that is actually polished brass. But you know the shocking thing? The revelation of this is, the beauty of Jesus is when he shows up, he does not talk of your crimes. Do you know, in scripture, Jesus had to rebuke this lady who had committed adultery in John 8. They found her in adultery. 
Then they were about to stone. He said, if you are without sin, cast the first stone. Everyone cast their stones on the floor and left. It was left to Jesus and the lady. Then Jesus said to her, where are your condemners? He said, they are gone. He said, okay, I condemn you not. Go and see no more. Jesus never said, go and see no more publicly. He always said it privately. Let me give you another example. In John chapter 5, a man was at the pool of Bethesda. Bethesda and when he was healed, he went to the temple. Do you know Jesus vanished after healing him? The Bible says later on, found the man in the temple and came to whisper in his ears in John chapter 5. And he says, go and see no more. So that something greater does not come on you. That is the dimension of God's love. Why am I saying what I'm saying? The beauty of Jesus is, Jesus will never discuss the fault of another. Jesus will never say, ah, he is suffering because he did this. Jesus will never say, ah, I think this guy, he was not working righteousness. That's why things are not working for him. That's not the language of Jesus. The beauty of Jesus is, he can see all your faults. He knew Peter had carried all his disciples after appearing to them to fish him. Yet Jesus appeared and said, children, have ye any fish? He was not angry. You and I will be angry after we resurrect and come to the people who abandoned us when we needed them. But Jesus rather still called them children. See the beauty of the Lord. And as you see the beauty of the Lord, you fall in love with him. And I like what Peter says. Grace comes. Grace comes. And when you spoke to the people, you fools, slow to heart to believe. Ought ye not these things to have happened, that the Son of Man will be exalted in glory? Then the Bible says in Luke 24, whilst he spake, he broke bread and they vanished from his sight. He vanished from their sight. And the Bible says, the disciples said, Cleopas and his friend, did our hearts not bear when he spoke? That's the beauty of the Lord. He is intimidating, yet he's welcoming. It's, it's, it's a very interesting thing. When the Lord comes in majesty, yet he's like a child. He's the most majestic. He has the most sensitive. Isn't it amazing? That's the beauty of our Lord. And today I pray that as you look at him, you will not suspect the Lord anymore. Your eyes will be so focused on him because there's too much to discover in this glorious, eternal, inexhaustible, riches of his beauty. Look at him. And like he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the verse number 6, he said, this, then he said, if we don't preach this gospel, it's be hid from them who do not hear the gospel because the God of this world has blinded their eyes so that they will not see the light of the glory. Then he says that, that the glory of the light of Jesus Christ shall be made manifest in the knowledge of him. The Jews like light, the Greeks like knowledge, and the Romans also like glory. That is why in that same 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, sorry, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, all the three major uh, sects and races of the time were all addressed. Is that the glory, which is for Rome, the knowledge, which is for the Greeks, and the light, which is for the Jews, are all seen in the face of Jesus. So if you are looking for glory, it's in Jesus' face. If you are looking for light, it's in Jesus' face. Did you know how Paul said in Acts chapter 26 verse 13, when he spoke to Agrippa, he said, by the time of noonday, he said the Lord appeared and his countenance was brighter than that of the sun. So ladies and gentlemen, look at the Lord. He's brighter than the sun. Look at the Lord. He's glorious than the moon. Look at the Lord. He eclipses the blessings and the abilities of men. And he still makes himself available and accessible to all. Oh, his eyes are dust eyes. And his heart is full of the desire to serve. Today, may you find beauty in him. And may your life be transformed forevermore. And I bless you that as you set the Lord before you, even in your imagination, you begin to see he's the greatest hero. He's the greatest supplier of all you need. Even in Jesus' name, amen.